A pandemic of seismic proportions is on the horizon for females in the fitness industry. You can see more and more females on the internet, influencers and all of them have changing voices. You have to be aware about this because it can happen to you or your loved ones or your girlfriend that you want to get jacked. Here are three tips to help maximize your progress in your fitness journey. Start prep or in a prep and you look like a string bean or you feel like you lost. So a couple days ago, I announced that I was running for Miss Health and Fitness 2023. Five mistakes that people make when they're trying to lose weight. How deep my voice is and my steroid use and how much and on and on and on it goes. Um, but I'm here to tell you it's not steroids. I'm natural. You're natural? Yeah. Lifetime natural? Yes. How do you think I keep my face? Hey everybody, my name's Layla. I truly think that coaching and personal training is learning how to have a good relationship. It feels incredible. I've, I've been working at this for over a year now. And Did you know that 80% of New Year's resolutions fail? My name is Ellen Ellen McCabe and I'm applying for the Shoe Fairy Pink Box Squad Angel Search in 2022. They resonate with me. They have the same values as me. The lowest weight of prep so far. I can't tell you how many times I've seen athletes step on stage that have no business being on stage. If you're new here, my name is Coach Colton. I bring you physique development tools, skills, and opinions that help moderate your health as well as get you the most progress possible. I do that through edutainment for the most part and try to make this as educational but as entertaining as possible. Stick with me if you enjoy this kind of content and you want to build a physique that has never been before seen. So first, let's get into this and talk about vocal changes in general. I think it is really important to explain in terms of anatomy, an actual human maturation of like the vocal function, we'll just call it. The voice is produced through interactions from the lungs, the vocal tracts, and the vocal cords, or more appropriately named vocal folds. Functionally, the lungs represent the power supply for voice, while the vocal folds, an oscillator of sense, acts as the sound producer or the thing that actually verbalizes that power. And the vocal tract acts as like an active resonator. I'm getting really technical here, so bear with me, but it's important to understand before we dive deeper. The subglottal pressure is responsible for the sound pressure, or in other words, the intensity or amplification of the sound that comes from the voice. The vibrating of vocal folds folds is what creates oscillation and pitch. They rhythmically contact each other, making audible noise. This is called a fundamental frequency. Through the vocal track, the glottal sound is articulated and amplified to create a vocal timbre. Now, hormones have a major role to play with these components of our voice structure, affecting both the larynx itself and the vocal system structure in general. Both physiological disorders and endocrine disorders in humans can manipulate how these organs work. The human voice is strongly modified by any small margin of modifications within the endocrine system. And for those of you who don't know, endocrine is basically talking about the hormones that we endogenously produce, the ones that are secreted in our body. For example, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. Not all of them, but some of them. The larynx is a secondary sexual organ, which is affected primarily by these hormones. And I know this is really, really in the details here, but stick with me because it's so so, so important to understand, especially if you're a female watching this using any form of androgens. We'll talk about this. So when we're talking about childhood and then maturating into an adult, usually you have profound voice changes that are exceptional in terms of getting deeper and producing more amplification or realistic sounds that we can formulate into words, which we usually call the English language. There's a phase called mini puberty, and this is what directly affects a lot of what our voice will become in the future. During mini puberty, boys have a higher circulation of testosterone and females have a higher circulation of estrogen. And this is what accounts for the sexual dimorphic voice tendencies early on as a child. And then as you develop, they become stronger and stronger. The onset of puberty, that is when you're getting older, you actually experience sexual changes, is preceded by a phenomenon called adrenarchy. This is characterized as a increase in androgen secretions by the adrenal gland. The adrenal androgens include DHEA or DHEA androstein dione and DHEA sulfate. This is usually what alters the appearance of one's body, body odor, even pubic hair. Then at puberty, this is when the HBTA access or the hypothalamic pituitary testicular access is 
starting to get working. At puberty, the reactivation of the hypothalamic gonadostat and secretion of gonadotropin releasing hormone are responsible for gonadotropin secretion, follicle stimulating hormone or FSH and luteinizing hormone LH by the pituitary gland, which stimulates to the testes and ovarians to produce T or E2, otherwise testosterone or estrogen. Clinically, the first physiological change during puberty are the appearances of secondary sex characteristics, in particular testosterone testicular enlargement in males and breast development in females. But with puberty, significant sex-related modifications of the voice organ take place as well, with an enlargement and an elongation of the larynx. The vocal tract and vocal folds in males experience more dramatic changes than females, reaching a mean vocal fold length of 1.6 centimeters compared to a mean length of 1.0 centimeters in females and a mean vocal tract length of 16.9 centimeters compared to 14.1 centimeters in females. The difference can be explained by so-called secondary descent of the larynx, a male-specific sexual secondary feature occurring during puberty. Testosterone is part of the mechanism that causes this vocal fold extension and growth because of the AR or androgen receptors mediated on the larynx and vocal folds and the vocal tract. With males going through maturation, usually after puberty, voice drops about one pitch or an octave, while a female's voice tends to drop only three to four semitones. There's really three stages of this mutation or maturation, and it's really important to understand these because you're gonna see a representation in this in the females we're addressing. Phase one is called the pre-mutation phase. The voice quality at this stage becomes flat, hoarse, and breathy, meaning more air is able to escape the larynx and vocal folds, creating a more amplified voice. The second phase is called the proper mutational phase. Sudden alterations in pitch, and again, sort of that scratchy-ish kind of voice. And then post-mutational phase, this is once all the physiological changes have actually solidified, the voice has reached maturation quality, meaning it's at its predetermined octave. And this is where it reaches the typical adult timber and voice range. So we just understood a couple things, and I want to create a TLDR of this all. First, the maturation process mediates vocal changes through different arrays of sex hormones. Estrogen and androgens have their own interplay on how the vocal structure as an entire unit is altered and even mutated to some degree. As one goes through puberty, there's two phases in which androgens or estrogen are expressed locally in these areas. The one is called mini puberty, which is a small period during infant ages where a small blast of either testosterone or estrogen is mediated and that can create the first architectural changes in someone's voice. Then the second phase is the puberty phase, where a lot more androgens are mediating the descent of the larynx and expansion of those vocal folds. This in turn creates a lower octave by about one octave in males and about three to four semi-octaves in females. But the females don't have as much testosterone, they have a little bit more estrogen and therefore they're able to maintain more of the angelic voice. And as you see individuals go Going through puberty, usually in males, you have three phases. The first phase is where you have a crackly voice, a hoarse voice. The second phase is where things are still a little uneven. Your tones aren't necessarily exact. You're still learning how to speak and your vocal folds aren't necessarily flapping. Sounds weird, but it's actually appropriate. Flapping at the correct way. And the third phase of that is proper mutational. And that means that the mutation, the physiological change needed to create the voice that you have has fully solidified. Now there's something really interesting here that relates to female menstrual cycles and I'm almost done with the technical stuff. A variety of voice changes have been described across the different phases of the menstrual cycle. The best voice quality is observed during ovulatory periods when estrogen reaches its highest level. This is not surprising considering that estrogen promotes increased secretion of mucus by the granular cells above and below the vocal folds, resulting in better mucosal viscosity. Moreover, estrogen also improves permeability of blood vessels and capillaries of the vocal folds with consequent better tissue oxygenation. And all I'm saying here is that essentially when you get an individual that has a maybe higher than standard estrogen due to hormonic variability within the menstrual cycle, their vocal quality and the sort of angelic voice that a female might have is further improved. 
This is a really important feature about the things I'm going to address. So the most changes in females, just to briefly summarize, happens when estrogen and progesterone fall and a relative increase in androgens is seen. And what happens is these two things potentiate edema within the vocal folds, increased glottal contact, which again builds more pressure to create sort of a deeper vibration, which in turn creates a lower voice. And this happens even in a absence of hormones, meaning exogenous hormones. In cases of menopause, it's actually very common for females to experience some vocal changes in specifically vocal deepening. Now, for those of you who don't know menopause is when females simply do not produce their own estrogen and therefore they have a higher ratio of androgens. This causes a slight bit of virilization, changing the timbre of their voice, i.e. the thickening of their vocal folds due to edema and actual tissue growth mediated by having a higher than normal testosterone level. And subsequently, they also are going to have less estrogen mediating a healthy vocal fold. So we're done talking about the vocal anatomy and now I think it's really important to discuss what's actually happening in the females that we're addressing here. First, we just talked a lot about androgens. Now, what are androgens? Well, there's actually a lot of different androgens. You have testosterone, which is the endogenously produced version of an androgen that males thrive off of, but even females thrive off of. But as a therapeutic potential, doctors back in the 60s, 70s, 80s produced a lot of different offshoots of testosterone. They basically took the testosterone molecule, cleaved it up a little bit, and tried to reshape it so that they could create another hormone that wasn't natural, it was a synthetic hormone, and produced therapeutic effects within a female or androgen sensitive population, being children or females. So to this day, androgens are used as a therapeutic treatment for things like skin disorders, or burn victims, or people who just had surgeries on tendons and ligaments. All sorts of different populations. But one population that wildly abuses androgens is any physical sport slash fitness. So you have testosterone and its derivatives and some of which are what we call 17 alkylated, which means your liver can metabolize them by avoiding the first pass of the liver and therefore they can be ingested orally. Now, a lot of females in this industry will look towards androgens and say, that's gonna help me get jacked because surely enough, it helped the other dude get jacked. But here's where some big flaws come up. First of all, androgens are a male hormone through and through. It doesn't matter which one you use, it is a male hormone. The idea behind creating different synthetic versions of a male hormone was to make them less impacting to a female, causing therefore less virilization, which means the development of secondary male characteristics in a female. But what was found out quite quickly after the development of all of these drugs was that none of them were really that effective at preventing secondary male characteristics from developing in infants, children, or in females. That doesn't mean that females aren't willing to risk a little bit of virilization to get a greater physique or improve body composition. And that also doesn't mean that all androgens created are the same. Some synthetic forms of androgens have less affinity to bind to the androgen receptor, mediating less secondary male characteristics. But that doesn't mean they are not doing that. And that doesn't mean you're infinitely protected against secondary male characteristics as a female using these things. It just means that one androgen might be better over another androgen. Or in this case, we can actually just replace androgen with steroid. Either way, downstream, when that androgen is mediating the androgen receptor, which is causing these vocal cord changes, it is causing edema, thickening of the tissue, when lengthening and lengthening and repositioning entirely of the vocal system. Now, you'll also remember something that's really important in which I discussed a little bit earlier in this video, which is the three phases of vocal maturation. You remember how I said that the first phase is when a male's voice is kind of hoarse and cracky and not so convenient? It's kind of embarrassing, in fact. It isn't deep, but it's just kind of awkward. Well, that's a lot of what you see when a female is predisposing herself to vocal cord changes. 
changes. It doesn't mean that her vocal cords have permanently changed, but it does mean that the beginning of those cascades have started to happen. The second stage is where you start to actually see deepening of the voice and more flattened tonal curves and inability to produce accurate tones in general, which is where we see most females deploying some of these steroidal compounds. And the third stage, which is when you just straight up have the complete maturation and it's solidified, it's who you are now, is where the voice actually fully deepens. And you can see this in a lot of females who have been using androgens for a very, very long period of time. Their voices have permanently become deeper and even their throat structure and chin structure have changed. And you can see this, a whole other topic that I could go into on a whole other video, but it's important to know. So after all that information, how can you prevent this from happening to yourself, to your girlfriend, friend to your mom who wants to get chat. Everything depends on dose times time exposure. When we're using androgens, it is an equation of simply how much are you using and multiplied by the time you are on said compound. So for instance, let's say you're on for eight weeks as a female using some particular androgen. And then you also are using a high amplitude or dose of that androgen. The eight weeks is going to multiply by the dose and equate to a greater outcome in virilization. But if you were to, let's say, have a very small window of time where you're using that androgen at a higher dose, the multiplication of it wouldn't equate to that big of a result. Likewise, if you used a very, very low low dose over a very long period of time, the equation wouldn't result in this massive virilization at the end of it. But if you used a mediocre dose for a very long period of time, you're going to experience virilization and lowering of voice. This is the most important concept to understand if you are a female going down this path or a male who is, I don't know, guiding a female down this path. Also, different compounds have different affinity to different receptors. And this is where things can get really, really complicated when we start talking about nuclear interaction, but understand that some androgens are different than others. For example, what you see a lot of females using within the bodybuilding space is Anovar or Winsthrol. These are two dihydrotestosterone derivatives that were synthesized to be taken orally in both males and females. Now, these guys in particular have unique effects because of their off-target effects, but also because of their very, very target effects. For example, Winstrol is more of a global product, meaning that that androgen is going to affect a lot more androgen receptors in a lot more different areas. Whereas Anovar, it seems to be pretty exclusive towards soft tissue and bone mineral density and even a little bit of fat liberation, but this is really contentious within the space, so I'm not going to mention that. So by doing your work and choosing the right androgen, you can avoid some of these side effects altogether. But there's even a step you could go that is way better than that. Non-hormonal agents. We want to leverage as much as possible for the androgen sensitive, i.e. females, non-hormonally affecting agents. This would be things like metformin, clenbuterol, IGF-1, growth hormone, insulin, mechanical growth factor, and various other peptides. I mean, there's, there's literally thousands of peptides in use out there right now. But none of these are particularly bad for the hormonal access. We don't see any alterations in estrogen. We don't see any alterations in androgens. It can stay relatively stable without any input on that access and thus no subsequent effect on vocal maturation. There is talk about SARMs, selective androgen receptor modulators in female use. And again, these are doing the same things as any other androgen. It was theorized that they would be selective by nature, but when actually put into practice within clinical trials, it was found out very quickly that they are actually worse than other derivatives that we use right now. For example, Anovar. It is clinically less selective at targeting soft tissues than Anovar is any SARM. And so the, the ultimate problem there is that you develop these voice maturations and other secondary male characteristics that you certainly don't want. Contributing towards that also is organ damages from the compound itself. It's actually really poorly metabolized by the liver, causing a lot of enzymatic stress. So lastly, I guess the important part is what do you do if you are at the point where you want to enhance your physique? And I am not going to tell you to do this or not to do this. I am not 
a doctor, this is just educational content. But what I do like to say here is hopefully you've maxed out your potential by dieting appropriately for a very, very long period of time and training appropriately for a very, very long period of time. Now, as a female, I typically coach a lot of them and I'll be real, the training and nutrition is pretty fucking skewed most of the time and that can be corrected to gain 30% more results instantly. But the psychology of females is quite different in a sense to males where that progress and that sort of consistency is going to require a different type of coaching that is more on a longevity scale as opposed to an acute results scale. And so you have to really be patient with these clients. You have to be patient with yourself. And I don't think many people are. They're like instantaneous results. And so they obviously deploy these compounds quite soon to get that instantaneous result. But regardless, the things you need to consider are, like I mentioned, dose times time exposure. The lower the dose of any androgen, the longer longer you can acceptably be on something. So in a perfect world, how I would use this equation plus understanding the affinity of certain androgens to create different secondary male characteristics, I would deploy something like oral anavar. But here's the big catcher. You have a lot of females and I talk to a lot of Brazilians and Venezuelans and what they're doing over there is absolutely mind blowing to me at the doses. But realistically, this is real, real talk. If you can take 2.5 milligrams of anavar every day for six months, you're gonna be relatively fine in an aspect of anti-virilization. Now, any dose of androgen will mediate some amount of virilization. It's inescapable completely. If just going through a menopausal state is enough to induce these secondary male characteristics, I assure you that taking more than the natural amount of androgen within your body at any dose is going to induce some form of that virilization. Now, again, it might be on such a small scale that you could do it for years and years and years and years and never see an outcome that is is negative, but it is also potentially going to do that for different individuals differently than other individuals. I would also consider the use of other forms of androgens as well that are not oral. And you see oral compounds do have some hepatotoxic tendencies to them because of the way they're metabolized in our body. So if you can use injectable compounds, you sort of avoid the need to be precautious about your liver function, for instance. And if I was to have a female going down the injectable route, it would literally be something like six milligrams of testosterone in a week because that's slightly over the physiological amount a female might produce or it's just at least at the top end of what she might produce naturally so virilization won't really be in the equation as long as she's dosing appropriately which hopefully is as frequently as possible meaning daily if we were talking ideally we, and we know the importance of having estrogen around and the thing about dihydrotestosterone derivatives like Andovar or Winstrol is that they don't have a downstream conversion into estrogen so a female might be lacking some estrogen She'll naturally produce it, but she's also going to be suppressed to some degree. So testosterone in my mind is a great way to keep things physiologically upregulated, but not causing a severity of vocal cord changes. Secondly, what I would do for a female looking to enhance herself and become physically better is use a peptide or use an ancillary that doesn't directly impact the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian access as many of these sorry, all of these androgens do. And the reason that these females are doing this is directly to improve their physique, improve their standing within different categories of bodybuilding as well as just on social media. In fact, the, the one girl that I showed at the beginning of this has that podcast. And a lot of you have probably seen this podcast on like your explore page on Instagram. Start prep or in a prep and you look like a shrink bean or you feel like you lost your look or you lost your muscle mass or you lost your bubble fullness size. You might have stopped training hard. Athletes think they start a prep and they're like, all right, time to deload, time to take out all my barbell movements. And found that there was a lot of fucking comments about her voice and just jokes. And it's pretty terrible, to be honest with you. The, the, the jokes aren't nice. And my point in making this video is the physique that she has could have been obtained without any androgens at all. It realistically could have been obtained with other forms of enhancements, such as peptides, insulin, or even ancillaries like a low-dose clenbuterol, which does activate mTOR through an adrenergic response. 
response. And altogether, she could have avoided having a deepening voice over many years of what I assume to be use. And likewise, with many other females that have addressed, like Layla Hermosi, I would say the exact same things. These enhancements, these physical appropriations could have been done in a different manner, more safely, without the consequential results of having a match-rated voice. So if you or someone you know is very interested in using androgens to enhance their physique, and again, androgens refers to hormonal steroid compounds, Anavar, Winstrol, Primabolin, dihydrotestosterone derivatives like Primabolin or Mastron. You have testosterone, you have D-Ball, you, <laughs> you have so many, there's so many out there. Just ensure that they understand the equation of dose times time exposure, plus also understand there's so many other compounds you could use to get amazing results. Like to get to a national level in bodybuilding, which is huge, I mean, that's a massive undertaking without any use of hormonal agents at all. But at the end of the day, I know these people are still going to do what they want to do. Let me know what you think down in the description because this is a pretty important topic for me. It's something I run into a lot as a coach and I'd love to hear what you guys have seen on Instagram in real life or what you've done about this kind of stuff. But in the next video, we'll catch you later. Deuces.